Hello and welcome. While COVID-19 has placed unfounded economic and psychological challenges in our lives, unknowingly, it's a little bit like the pandemic has created a steady stream of stress that is just trickling through our subconscious minds. Now, whether we like it or not, we are constantly having to adapt our family's lives to a new sense of normal and everything that comes along with it. And as hard as it seems, if there was ever a time to take control of our health and well-being by placing Placing priority on our self-care, it would be right now. So if you are an exhausted parent who finds it hard and difficult to consider making time for self-care and is looking for advice other than, I guess, the cliche self-care that we know and hear about in the media all the time, then tune in. This chat is definitely for you. Now, to help share her self-care tips for exhausted parents, we welcome our special guest, Emma Diepenhorst, an occupational therapist who supports the health and well-being of parents and especially new parents. Now, Emma holds an impressive hat trick of qualifications and that being a master's in occupational therapy studies, a postgraduate diploma in psychology and a bachelor of science psychology. You go girl, that's awesome. <laughs> now she's also founded Elevation Women's Health following the birth of her son after realizing the disconnect between physical and mental health guidance for new parents. Thank you so much for joining us today. How are you? I'm good, thanks, Rachel. How are you? Yeah, I'm really excited to have this chat and I think this is a really important topic to be talking about um, mm. at the moment, um, if not ever. <laughs> as, as always, yeah. um, you know, and we are living through an incredibly challenging time at the moment. And it's common that when people are stressed and overwhelmed, the last thing that's on their minds is planning out a self-care regime for themselves, especially parents with young children. So I'd just love to know what's your opinion on this. <laughs> yeah, I think we, um, yeah, it's often, I agree, we put ourselves last and it can often be because we think that self-care is this, you know, an afternoon at the day spa or, you know, things that require big blocks of time or investment in money. Um, but it, it can be a lot simpler than that. And yeah, that's what I'm hoping people can hear from today is the little bits they can do to look after themselves, particularly at the moment when things are um, really, really challenging for a lot of families. Yeah. And in your opinion, why is it more important than ever that parents put themselves first? I think parents at the moment are under just um, incredible stress. We've got, you know, working from home for some people that brings its stresses in itself. Then we've got people who are having to go into the workplace, which is, <laughs> is quite stressful, you know, risking exposure to COVID-19. Um, and we've got a large cohort of people who are either just finished trying to homeschool their children for a period of time. And as you know, down here in Melbourne, about to ramp up into another round of homeschooling. So <laughs> having all of that, and then in the mix of, we can't do our normal day-to-day -day things that we can do, we normally do, you know, our occupations, that's, you know, what I'm, I specialise in is, you know, our occupations are all the everyday things that we need and want to do all of them are out of whack at the moment. So yeah, you know, all, all our leisure, it's looking very different. So it's making looking after ourselves and being relaxed, very difficult. Absolutely. And as you just alluded here in Australia, there's a, a disparity between the states and territories and the levels of lockdown and active COVID cases in each state and territory. And that being said, we have a, a wide contrast in circumstances that parents are currently in, as you just said, you know, and some that are recovering from the intensity of lockdown and some that have been thrown right back into it <laughs> with homeschooling. Yeah. And irrespective of what situation parents are finding themselves in the context of COVID, you know, in your view, how can parents use this time to establish and or improve on their self-care? Yeah, it's a good question. I think um, even even for parents going back into lockdown and homeschooling again, I think that a lot of parents did learn a lot the first time around. So, you know, some families learnt that their kids can actually do more than they thought they could. And so really leveraging on that increased independence that some children have shown, um, looking at, I guess, new efficiencies. Um, you know, a lot of families discovered they don't need to go to the supermarket several times a week. Yeah. You know, going a fortnight online shopping. 
that's freeing them up to um, spend some, some time thinking about their own needs. Um, yeah. Leveraging um, even some people have got some better work-life balance out of this in terms of flexible work arrangements. So it's really now is a good time if you're in a position with your employer to negotiate some um, different working conditions. And that's not necessarily working from home. It might be, you know, extended hours, compressed work week, um, a whole host of things. Mm. Um, there's yeah, a lot of learnings in the workplace that um, will have trickle down effects into our home lives. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah. you help you help support women from pre-pregnancy and beyond to identify um, effective strategies to build a meaningful life that fosters both physical and mental health. And that is brilliant. Mm -hmm. And I congratulate you and salute you <laughs> on that. So I'd love to know from your perspective, can you tell us a little more about where the inspiration came from and why you do what you do? Um, I guess the inspiration came from... I guess my parents group was kind of one area where I realized, oh, not everyone is using the same strategies that I'm using to look after my mental health, but also physical health. Um, you know, the common, the common chats in um, early parents group around incontinence and painful sex and all those sorts of bits and pieces. Um, I realized not everyone had the same knowledge. Um, and it was sort of bringing all those bits and pieces together. Um, some people were going off and seeing, you know, a physiotherapist. Some were seeing counsellors that, you know, they had some issues, you know, with stress and anxiety. But they were really struggling to, I guess, you put those strategies in place into the, I guess, the reality with a, a new baby. It's very, it's very difficult to find the time and to work out how to weave those things into everyday life. Mm. So that's what, yeah, I sort of the parents group and I guess the, the um, I had a key moment lifting my own son onto the change table, which was a really inappropriate height. And I was like, why am I doing this? I should know better as an occupational therapist. Um, and yeah, just kind of the idea spread from there. And, and talking about time, you know, parents are busy and their days are full, very, very full. So how do you suggest parents find the time in their day for self-care? Yeah, so I think one of the biggest things is thinking about self-care in a really broad context. So self-care is not, you know, doing some yoga and that's it. Self-care is all the things that are in your life, all the occupations you are doing, mm -hmm. you know, from your leisure occupations to the work that you do to, you know, your relationships <clears throat> and also the things that the occupations you're saying no to as well. So, yeah. Um, and it's really different for everyone. So yes. one of my favourite occupations I've realised I really miss out on is a lot of parents hate swimming lessons. Oh, you know, do it's they? The of, it's, yeah, a lot of complaints. It's the bane of their Saturday morning. Um, whereas for me, I love it. I don't get in the pool. I am a really cold-blooded person. I love to sit and just in that humidity on a Saturday morning, love it. Like yes. that is you know, a meaningful occupation for me, but mm -hmm. for other people, it's not. So it's about thinking about what you do love, what you don't love. And I think out of this, a lot of parents are going to realise there's some extracurricular things they were doing that were, that were spending their time. Doing that they you shouldn't, know, they don't necessarily life. need to do anymore and or yeah, the zapping energy. weren't actually getting any great benefit out of it. And it was yep. costing the parents a lot of time and money. So yes. hopefully and there's a lot of reflection on that. Absolutely. And there's a line from the article that I would like to read out. When you describe the activities that make you personally feel content and give you energy back, which is exactly what you were just talking about. So this is quoting you. These moments are like little bursts of relaxation dispersed throughout my day. Some, um, sorry, small bursts of activity that meet your sensory needs um, are a really underutilized form of self-care. So can you please expand on this? So, so this is what you're saying, that self-care doesn't necessarily have to be something that you schedule out in your, your day. It can be, it can be, but it's more about yeah. finding how you live your life um, usually. And, 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 and I guess through the, the changes that we have now with COVID, um, if we are in lockdown, but finding moments in your day that you love doing what you're doing and having that and, and absorbing that energy to help fill your mm -hmm. cup. Is that what it is? 
Yeah, and it's about a lot about thinking about the impact that your own environment has on you. So as okay. OTs, we look at the doing and also the context that that's occurring. So I think a lot of us are realising with that increased time in our house is what's working for us and what's not. So mm-hmm. I guess personally in our household, you know, our evenings, I would say the environment is very zen because, you know, it's to do with the lighting, you know, we're Yes, I think the lighting is a big thing. We've been lighting a lot of candles actually at the moment also, and that's helping us. We have a TV, so it's not that noise that I find, like me and my husband find irritating, but that's very different for other people. So for other people to feel relaxed, they might actually need the television going and the, the lights bright. So it's about thinking about what you're doing, but what your environment is like as well and whether you need to, um, yeah, change elements of that, whether it's, you know, lighting, smell, um, you know, all, all the five senses, the noise, um, yeah. movement. Hmm. Yeah, I, I, as I was saying before, but yeah, we, at the end of the day, as I'm making dinner, even have like candles sort of around the, the house and then ensure that when we are um, watching TV later at night, that the lights are down and then do not turn the lights all back on before you go back to bed type of thing, mm. knowing that yeah. um, it does actually help you fall asleep a lot faster. So it's about looking at our day, what are we already doing in our day and about sort mm. of bringing that into as part of our self-care regime. It's not about going, oh, I book in for a massage once a week or whatever it is. Is that, mm. is that right? Yeah, that's right. Because that's not attainable for most people. Correct. Um, yeah. Like yeah. it might feel good when you do eventually get there, if you get there, <laughs> but it's about having the every day so you can keep going yeah. you know, through all those really difficult times and you've just got your, your little recipe for what um, helps you feel good and, um, yeah, what keeps you relaxed and sane. Nice. Okay, well, talking about the article, we published your article titled Self-Care Tips for Exhausted Parents Post-Lockdown. Now, for someone who hasn't yet read the article, can you please tell us what it's about and what inspired you to write it? Um, what it's about, it's, I guess it's about taking that really broad view of self-care um, and looking at... Um, you know, the the different approach that we all need to take. Self-care is different from you to me to other people. Um, And, but there are some commonalities um, that we need to think about with our self-care. So, you know, sleep is one of the biggest um, things that we all need to do. Uh, And I think it's it's one of those things that a lot of people do quite poorly, that they don't realise that they're having poor sleep um, necessarily. Um, So, yeah, you know, the basics of, sleeping, eating well, movement is a really big one. I think people can get stuck with self-care of thinking about, oh, I must, you know, good self-care is going for a run or Mm -hmm. going to the gym where it's really, if you think about movement, think about what makes you feel good and not that focus on, you know, what might make you look good, I think is really important thing to keep in mind. Yeah. Um, and the article really outlines where the energy zappers are in our lives and the things um, that can make us tired, I guess, without even knowing it, as you were just saying, and then outlines um, how we can find the things that really top up our energy. And it's also um, a, a, about the fundamentals of good sleep practices, as you were just saying, mm-hmm. um, exercise, diet, and social life. Now, also um, about the apprehension about lifting of uh, COVID restrictions for some mm-hmm. families. So can you tell us a little bit more about this then? Yeah, I think, um, yeah, it really became obvious with the, I guess, the circles I move in. I'm seeing a lot of parents that, you know, restrictions were lifted. All of a sudden you were allowed people in your home and there were these people with precious little newborns that were Mm. becoming very concerned that, you know, friends and family wanting to just come on round when, you know, they were rightly so really anxious about um, having people in their home and being near themselves and their baby. But I think it goes beyond um that group you know there's a lot of people for you know it was a really big deal for them to go into lockdown that was a really big adjustment and then coming out is a big adjustment too so getting used to around people again for some people has been um a a real challenge and it's really Um, about it's like normalizing fear you mentioned in the article mm -hmm. and and around re-engaging with the community pre-COVID life, but it's not pre-COVID life because COVID now is in our lives and it's not going away because we don't necessarily have a vaccine. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it is 
very different to pre-COVID life, don't you think? There is there is no going back to normal. It's this new sense of normal, don't you think? It is. It's definitely. And it's about, um, I guess, giving yourself permission to, to not feel okay with things at times. Like yes. It's about reflecting on your own needs and, and what you need to do. Restrictions might be lifting but that doesn't mean you have to change absolutely what you're doing That's um, obviously i'd always advocate to work follow the restrictions and but i i think it's great for people to be more cautious than them if vision for them yeah and as an occupational therapist you use strategies beyond the stock standard do yoga, meditate, or get a massage that are unattainable, unattainable for many parents, as you mentioned. So how is your view of self-care different to the advice that we often see? I think it's about looking at, yeah, not, not your cliche self-care occupations. It's about really analysing with a person what occupations are actually filling their cup. Um, what occupations aren't and are actually detracting and what they need to actually get rid of out of their life. And I guess looking at that in context of, uh, you know, the 168 hours of a week that we've got, mm -hmm. I think it's uh, very common to look at, you know, when, you know, when we talk about work-life balance, it's often examined in the space of 24 hours, but that's not a very helpful paradigm to look at those sorts of things. I think if you look across the space of a week, which is 168 hours, then assessing as to, you know, if you've got enough um, occupations that make you feel good um, and how you're, I guess, weaving them throughout your week. Mm -hmm. And let's face it, I guess not everyone really is into massages or facials. And the media mm. does really have a cliche and a standard portrayal of what is self a self-care lifestyle and what it does actually look like. Um, yeah. and this may not suit everyone's preferences uh, also. Mm. So is there any self-care advice that you can apply to everyone and or is this a one-size-fits-all approach? What's, what are your thoughts? Yeah, yeah self-care is definitely not a one-size-fits-all. It's about thinking about um, your own specific needs and your lifestyle and the demands on your time so thinking about your sensory preferences what your interests are what your finances are all of those sorts of things will make what works for you very different to what works for me um, there is i guess there's definitely the commonalities that we all need to think about when um, making sure we are looking after ourselves so that is you know the the boring but very important you know sleeping well and i guess if i have one bit of advice uh, for everyone it is to get those screens out of the bedroom they are terrible for sleep it's not just the blue light that um, tricks your brain to thinking that it's daytime it's also at a cognitive level um, your brain is not switching off it's, it knows the phone's there so that is having a really big impact on a lot of people's sleep so if there's one thing people do out of this today <laughs> is to get those hey. phones out of the bedroom <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. And what else can parents do, to, I guess, to start to develop an effective self-care routine? Like, where do they start otherwise? I think it's, it's really, people think this is really tedious, but it is a really valuable activity is to actually look at their time use. And that might be, you know, you're actually writing down in a day what you're doing. Um, mm -hmm. Looking at the time you're spending doing different things, and I bet the answer will really surprise you. So, looking it's at how much time, it's take an inventory of your time. I've actually done that many years ago, many years ago, um, yeah. when I was on a diet, um, and I had to write down everything that I was eating. And it wasn't until I actually started to see what was everything that I was consuming during the day. I was like, my goodness, I've consumed that much. So it's a little bit the same sort of philosophy, it is. isn't it? In the, in the fact that if yeah. you actually write down how you plan and what you do throughout your day, you realise where the, the, the time sort of zappers are. Is that right? Yeah, it's exactly the same. And that's why, you know, the evidence shows that um, food diaries really do work. And it's, it's a similar thing with your time diary. We improve at what we measure. So, yeah, but you need that baseline of what you're actually doing with your time. Because a lot of things, you know, like housework can expand to fill the time we give it. So if we get a handle on how we're spending our time, it makes it easier to look at where you can actually make improvements at, you know, doing the things that you love and that are meaningful for you. And is it also about finding, um, you know, 
understanding what it is that actually makes us feel re rejuvenated and comforted and making time um, as a priority to, to fit those into our day as well, would you say? Yeah, definitely. That self-understanding is fundamental um, yeah. to yeah, working out what's going to work for you. Get off, you know, get off the Instagram self-care hashtag. That's not going <laughs> to give you an answer. It really is like that honest reflection with what makes you feel good. And you might have to experiment with different things. Don't be afraid to try things and go, oh, I actually really hate that. And I guess don't feel like you need to be good at things as well. Like it's okay to do things that you're terrible at. I am a terrible bike rider. I, I look ridiculous when I ride a bike. I bet you don't, but... <laughs> I do. You see me riding along the bay and it looks like it's, you know, first time I've been on a bike in a very long time, but I'm just really unskilled at that. But I really love it. So I just do it anyway. So I so guess that's another thing for people to think about. It's, it's about that know thyself when you're really quite honest about, you know, about yourself and, and what... what is your likes, your dislikes and what you're good at and what you're not good at. It's about sort of adapting those, would you say? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And, and as you said at the start of the chat too, COVID has really presented us with a wonderful opportunity to, to reevaluate what really matters in our lives um, and how we want to spend our time um, in our chosen activities and the amount of commitments that we are and were cramming into our lives. So in your view, how can parents use their COVID-19 insights um, to guide positive changes in their lives um, post lockdown? I think, yeah, it comes back to that, you know, using that opportunity that they had to get off that crazy merry-go-round, reflecting on what worked well in lockdown um, and what they'd like to have more of from lockdown and what they need to get rid of out of their life. As well. Um, that they realise, yeah, that they, they don't actually need and doesn't bring value to them or their family. Yeah, I think a lot of families are finding that at the moment um, and, and having, I think if anything, COVID's really brought, in a weird way, a, a different level of simplicity to our lives. Stress along with it, but definitely yeah. um, a reintroduction to a more simpler life um, and something that our generation really haven't had much until now experience with. Um, now, that being said, can you tell us about more about the, the concept of occupation and what that means? Yeah, so occupations, we as an OT, occupational therapist, we take a, a broad view of what occupations are. So commonly occupations are referred to as, you know, paid employment, but we use, I guess, the, the old school definition of occupations is, you know, all the things we do to fill or occupy our time. So, uh -huh. so different to occupation being a job well of course yes that, that's right it, it was a very tough gig working in a, in a hospital and going up to an 80 year old who thought I was going to make them go back to work so, <laughs> so, so the concept of occupation is really about um, I guess looking at what we do throughout our day and sort of analyzing that is that right yeah, occupation, yeah, um, all the things that we need to do but also want to do and looking at it across, I guess, our day but also the lifespan. Our, our occupations change um, through different seasons of life. Um, of course, yeah. yeah. And throughout this COVID-19 era as well, I guess this concept is maybe liberating many parents to engage in other and more meaningful occupations like uh, spending quality time with their family and their own interests, like you just said before as well. Um, and spending mm. time on the things that give them energy rather than taking the energy away from them, would you say? Yeah, I think it's been a real mix. We've got on one hand, we've got what we call occupational deprivation, where we're not actually able to engage in a lot of the occupations we normally would. And a lot of them were the leisure type, you know, going out with friends, having brunch, but then we've also discovered all these new occupations that, you know, the, the arts and the crafts is certainly going gangbusters at the moment. Try and get some craft supplies from a Melbourne store and it's, it's a bit of a challenge. It's <laughs> uh, become such a big thing. Um, but, yeah, different occupations with the children. Um, yeah, there's been a lot of new learnings out of it from COVID. Mm. And what is occupational balance? I, I saw that in your article also. And how do, I guess occupational therapists use this concept that can actually help um, sort of benefit parents at this time? Yeah, so I guess it's, um, it comes back to that, making sure you've got the right mix of occupations in your life. So um, 
yeah, looking at it from that that broader, you know, week what, or month what, view. So what does that mean though? What does that mean in the sense that um, how you're feeling your day and that what you're feeling your day is is beneficial for, for you and your family? Is that right? Yeah, so there's definitely, you know, occupations that we have to engage in. You know, a lot of people don't have the choice of whether they have to work or not. So that might be, you know, eight or nine hours of their day that it's it's a non-negotiable. Yeah. But looking at what those other occupations are that fill the, the rest of their day, you know, eight hours of that is normally sleep. So what do you do with the remaining hours? Is that a... Um, is that a good balance? Are we spending too much time? Perhaps, you know, scrolling on our phone is a big time suck that um, I guess it, it can feel okay in the moment, but afterwards people often feel like they don't feel refreshed from spending time doing that. Mm-hmm. For some they do, but for a lot of people they don't. Um, you know, is there, you know, amount, the right amount of time spent with their children and doing um, more meaningful things with them or, you know, is it, housework that's taking up all of our day so that helps Um, that problem when we always say well I don't have any time I don't have enough time and it's about really analyzing what you do with your time to be able to create more of it really would you say yeah yeah well we've all got the same 168 hours in a week so it's about looking at that broadly some days are horrendous you know you might work um you know all day like long hours and that sort of stuff yeah yeah. yeah, that's right. Um, so it's but, about working smarter, not harder by the sounds of things. Yeah, definitely. And taking a not an all or nothing approach to looking at that balance. It, it might be really dodgy one day, but you might have you <laughs> know, the remainder of the week. Yeah. <laughs> so, but it's actually fine. So would you say that occupational therapists use the concept of occupational balance to assess the way that people spend their time and consider it? At how it impacts their health and well-being. So you would apply like... Yeah, definitely. It's it's part of, um, I guess, what we look at, I guess, depending on our client's goals, um, occupational balance is generally a big part of that. Um, so what would you guess- do if, if, if somebody does want more time in their day, but they, let's face it, they work full time, they've got a family, they've got a household, they've got two kids. I mean, mm. what sort of stuff do you do that any parent watching or listening would be able to instantly apply to their life that's going to help make a difference? I think start with sleep. Yep. <laughs> Follow my tips on getting a good night's sleep. Um, and then track your time. Just see, see what you're spending time on. You know, do you need to just lower your standards for housework, for example? Yep. Um, House doesn't lower your be perfect. Yep. Now. Nah. As Laura Vanderkam says, there's no 11 p.m. home inspection. So just, you know, keep a realistic uh, view on, on that. Um, and also, I guess, our expectations on our own parenting is, is a big one. Yeah. Yeah. And just do you think the media and society in general just have set the bar so high about these things that, you know, in our minds, we have, the, you know, Instagram that is, <laughs> and all of those things in our life that are showing us that, um, you know, our houses should be perfect and our children should be perfect. And, and re- these things aren't necessarily realistic, are they? No. No, they're definitely not. And I think we're really at a point in time, we've got kind of two schools of two camps going on in, in I guess, Instagram and Insta mumming, where we've got on one hand, we've got the crummy mummy where, you know, we're glorifying, you know, in some cases really below standard parenting that is, is unacceptable in some cases most of it's not, but on I know you mean one yes, yep. end of the spectrum we do. And then we've got, on the other hand, we've got, you know, the perfect mum. It's just, it's ridiculous. We just need a middle ground where people are just, you know, doing their best and... Couldn't and agree happy. with you anymore. Yeah, mm. absolutely. So overall, I guess on what I'm hearing is that you sort of apply a, a holistic approach across... Um, I guess everyone's essential occupations that we have in our life, things such as sleep, you know, physical activity, um, social engagement and leisure. So it's not, um, I guess, a work-life balance. It's a life with balance, would you say? Yeah, that's right. I think work-life balance really um, oversimplifies things. It's not just two components to our life. There's multiple components. Um, so we need to look at all, all of the right parts. Yeah. So we just need to see where our time goes and um, I guess what, where there's an opportunity to swap out some occupations for more meaningful ones, would you say? 
Yeah, I think that's a really good starting point and, and reflecting further on the environment that we're also doing these occupations, maybe tweaking, you know, whether it's lights, whether it's um, sound, whatever, um, making sure that's actually serving us as well. Mm -hmm. So we've sort of touched on a lot of um, important points and hopefully every parent watching and listening would have um, key takeaways, but how would you summarise your key messages from the chat today then? I think look look at things across the 168 hours. Um, look at your own expectations. Are they ex actually other people's expectations of you or are they your own maybe unrealistic expectations? We can't do absolutely everything all the time. Um, and really honestly reflect on what is self-care for you. It doesn't have to look pretty. It doesn't have to be what other people find uh, valuable. It's about ser what serves you and your mental health and your body. Wonderful. Now, if parents have got any other questions for you and or want to reach out to you after watching and listening to this today, whereabouts can they find you? Um, they can find me on Instagram um, at Elevation Women's Health or um, contact me via the website uh, at www.elevationwomenshealth.com.au. Well Wonderful. I've loved this chat and look forward to another one, hopefully in the not too distant future. You take care and we'll speak soon. Thanks, Rachel. Bye. Uh, bye.